lovies. It's um, David McGillivray here, horror icon and comedy legend, and I'm back with another edition of Little Did You Know, the chat show from the book of the same name. And this is a show in which I talk to people I find interesting. I hope you agree. This is the uh, the new look. Little did you know, the green screen has gone. I'm here in the full glory of my study in West London. And look how casually that shirt has been draped over the mirror behind me. It's because there's a light shining into it. That's why it's a technical thing. Now, should you be so inclined, you can slip us a quid. And this is where a link pops up. Um, you know, you get goodies in return. I'll say no more about that. And um, instead, I'll move on to this week's special guest. Now, I think he's the actor I've played with more than any other. And yes, it's an innuendo and I just don't care. <laughs> he's most famous for saying one line in his first film. And he's probably going to hate me for bringing this up yet again, because of course he's done so many other things. He's done opera, he's done a superhero film. He's also beaten COVID-19 in order to go over to Spain to make another movie. How about that? Uh, shall we say hello to him? Why not? Hello there, the very <laughs> wonderful Tony Wise. Hello, possums. <laughs> a man of many talents and indeed voices. That was his Edna Everidge. Uh, <laughs> he's... I, can, I, I can hear the pounds dropping already. <laughs> he's a big Victoria Wood fan as well, <laughs> loveys. That's all going to come up later. I... Start, if I start going off on Victoria Wood, please stop me because I'll be here forever. You know, <laughs> you know the signal, Tony. I go like that, and then I know, yeah. that's all we get of Victoria Wood. That's coming later. First things first. Um, um, Tony, do you do you get fed up with people mentioning this line to you? You know the one I mean. But, yes, it always takes me by surprise, but it. It happens quite regularly because I, I never really, uh, you know, I just don't think about it. I mean, it's 34 years ago <laughs> and it all happened totally by chance. I was rung up um, because another actor couldn't do it, who I'd worked with and the casting director, um, Tessa Topolsky at the time, uh, just had seen me in the same show with this guy who, who, who'd been off the part, couldn't do it. So I was called up, literally sent the script the thing in day, turned up at Maida Vale at seven o'clock in the morning and uh, was put into this sort of policeman's outfit and uh, told to do the, do the line. And I have to say, that Bruce Robinson, I, I did it several times and uh, uh, Richard E. Grant just couldn't stop laughing, just falling about laughing. And Bruce Robinson actually said, Tony, could you? Take it down a little, please. <laughs> the, the time has come. You've got to say that line, Tony. Will you do it just for us? Get in the back of the van! It is indeed Get in the Back of the Van from uh, With Nail and I. The, oh. film, the film became a cult. And that line, I'm now going to tell you, Tony, has had 93,776 views on YouTube. Um, and uh, there's a lot of comments, and my favourite is from somebody called Mercutio, who says, I use this line to pick up girls, never fails. I've never used that one yet. <laughs> Does it work for any other genders? <laughs> well, you tell me. Now, now, look, do people shout, get in the back of the van to you in the street? No. Never, no, no. no. I'm, I'm... Um, what, one thing I have had is, um, which I must actually do, uh, some guy in a tribute band in Australia, his mate is 60, I think in February, and I got an email via my agent to please make a little short video clip. And you, know, you, you can ask for money for that sort of thing, but I, I'm gonna do it and ask them to give it to um, 
you know, um, Greenpeace or Friends of the Earth or something like that. So that's the only real sort of thing I've had from it recently. Well, I can reveal, however, that uh, Tony and uh, I were doing a play at the uh, Chocolate Factory here in London in uh, 2004. I was not the only member of the cast who was astounded in the bar after the play to see people coming up to Tony and telling him that they only came to see the play because he once said in 1987, get in the back of the van. I didn't know that. I'd, I'd either forgotten that or you never mentioned it to me. <laughs> I know I hate upstaging you, David. I really do. <laughs> uh, so 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 modest um why did that line catch on i don't know i, th I think it's because it was came right out of the blue i mean you have to sort of be quite high on marijuana i think to actually really enjoy the comedy of that which i didn't do for 10 years than i did and it was much funnier when you're on, on on marijuana but the guy playing the other policeman apparently just went like this <laughs> when I said the line, out of complete shock and surprise. Did, did anyone say to you that that well-known cliche, are you going to do it like that? <laughs> well, yeah, well, as I said, Bruce Robinson said, you know, can you, can you bring it down a bit? Because Richard E. Grant was just doubling up, you know, he was totally doubling up with it, you know. <laughs> you know, my theatrical background came to the fore, I'm afraid. <laughs> Talk about a scene stealer. Yes, we must talk about your theatrical background, Tony, because the, the thing I'm most envious of, I think, is that uh, quite earlier in your career, you were able to do, I think it was a British council tour, and you were able to go to countries like Libya and Syria that we're no longer able to visit. So you... I, I, I will correct you on that. I think I did about four British council tours uh went to europe and then we went to iraq and pakistan and also to sudan and zimbabwe and egypt of course i went to yeah and uh, the, the the iraq pakistan one was, was extraordinary because we went to iraq in that little window after we were when we when we were allies of saddam against the iranian regime and we were selling him arms and goodness as well which is why probably tony blair went looking for them in 2004 but couldn't find them and uh, uh, that's off the record by the way uh, <laughs> but I, I always remember we, we we went to mosul in the kurdish part baghdad and then basra in the south and my Goodness me. I mean, I was politically ignorant, naive. We all were just in the hands of the British Council. I remember in this theatre in Mosul, which is now just rubble, apparently, uh, you know, Mosul. Uh, into this theatre we went with all dusty old ropes and things like that. And there was this, there was this picture uh, on the stage and we thought, all right, we'll get rid of that. And the secret police were going, go put that back. It was a, a, a picture of Saddam Hussein, of course who had to be on stage the entire time, <laughs> could have been arrested. It was, it was absolutely fascinating. And, and of course, I met um, in Baghdad, I met one of the very, very few um, Kurdish students there, because no Kurds were really allowed to go to Baghdad in those days. And he gave me his Kurdish costume because I was so interested. I was so blown away by his generosity. I mean, they are a lovely people, um, Iraq. Certainly, you know, uh, in Basra, uh, that was a, a war zone completely. We, we performed in a theatre with broken windows down the side and the curtains sort of blowing in. It was the, the, the dressing rooms were flooded with sewage, so we had to change at the back of the stage and things like that. But the Basra, that was a more difficult audience because, of course, they're very, they're Shia, you know, very Shia, and, and they weren't really attuned to Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> But what, what unforgettable memories. Oh, absolutely. And then we went straight to Pakistan, where uh, Benazir Bhutto had literally the previous day been elected as president, you know, or prime minister or whatever it was. I can't remember now. So Pakistan was joyous as well. People on the streets, you know, the Pakistan People's Party and all the... And, and all these parties were allowed then. And it was a democracy then. I don't know if it still is, but... But, but 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 that we went to Lahore. We went up to um, 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 oh my goodness me, 
we went up the Khyber Pass anyway from, oh gosh, what's the town there? Uh, right by the border. I've forgotten it now. We went down to Karachi, but at the border, we were taken up the, the, up to the Khyber Pass by soldiers and we could hear the Russians sort of gunfire on, on Kabul about 20 miles away. I mean, it was absolutely extraordinary. We were the only people to go there, you know, yeah. I, I, I hate to do this, to, to move from the, the sublime to the gorblimey, really, but um, it, it is a, a, a fact that in uh, 2002, you did a, a quite different play. You're going to shudder, as I mentioned the title, but it was called Head Games. Now, oh. I went. I went to see this because by this time we'd worked together. I'm going to come. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But this is just an example of the fact that you know actors can do such different things. Moving from Shakespeare in Pakistan to a play at the Old Man in the Moon uh, Theatre, which no longer exists in in Chelsea. Um, uh, Tony has his head in his hands now because th this was an extraordinary play. Um, and I, I reviewed it for this magazine. Anyone remember this? <laughs> I mentioned um, uh, Head Games. It was about a theatre company that stages a gay play with gratuitous nudity in order to make money. And I said that Anthony Wise is the only one with any talent in the cast, and he also has the biggest penis. Now... <laughs> Listen, I tell you the secret to that. It was February, I remember it well, and I had to wait a long time for my entrance. There was a lot of frottage going on over the radiator backstage because <laughs> everything was shriveled. <laughs> the whole the I did bear my I bared my all for my art. It was embarrassing, but quite good fun as well. I, I um, uh, revealed in the review that everybody in the cast, with the exception of the woman, was naked I I in this play. And uh, I uh, said to um, Tony what, what I'd said in my review. And his reply was, um, yes, it's been said before. And uh, that's, of course, I'm talking about the penis reference. <laughs> You know, I, I made a few notes before this little interview about my career. I had not put head games in there at all. I completely forgotten about it until you mentioned it. Bloody typical. <laughs> I, I keep reminding Tony of this play because it makes me laugh. And I'm, I'm, I am actually glad to hear that it was fun as well. I was supposed to be um, 40 years old in that play. I was already 48. I mean, that's how I was playing down again, you know. <laughs> Oh, it's such a it, shame. It, it, I mean, he was, you know, it's not one of my proudest moments, but having said that, it was fun. It's gone. It's disappeared into the ether. We'll never see. No, rising. we'll never see that again on stage. I promise you, everybody, I really do. <laughs> it was a moment. But uh, as I say, I went to see that play because uh, Tony and I had already uh, been in a play called The Crime of Father Amaro in, mm. in Greenwich. And wow. that, that was a good that was a good experience. I really enjoyed that, uh, Tony. And then we, really was. we kept in touch. We were we were a, a little duo, weren't we? We were, uh, you know, like a, a comedy act. You were you were Father Amaro. Uh, no, you were um, the um the, the canon weren't you the, the the head the head religious chap i was i was canon diaz and people called me cameron diaz <laughs> i was father notario your very nasty snidey sidekick perfect casting for me <laughs> portuguese play uh, written by a contemporary of, uh, of charles dickens no less it was a very powerful play later filmed you mm. may remember mm. Mexico but we we had a great time mm. and um, subsequently I have to say oh well I said it in the intro we've, we've worked together um, quite a lot um, I then uh, took Tony to Morocco uh, haven't, you, haven't you 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 omitted all for nothing I do believe in that little uh, intro. <laughs> how did I manage <laughs> All for nothing, the most perfectly named play of all time. <laughs> well, I'm glad you jogged my memory, uh, Tony. So before we get on uh, to my my film in the place of the dead, let's just bring this up. Oh, 
let's get it out of the light. There we are. I wrote my uh, autobiography and I did uh, mention this play all for nothing. And uh, I mentioned the review it got in The Guardian. This was at the, uh, the Chocolate Factory. It was the first production at London's Chocolate Factory. And that theatre then became a bit of a cult producing major musicals. Um, but the review for our play from The Guardian was, I don't know how to pronounce this name because it's Portuguese, uh, Jorge, is it? Yeah. Perez, the author of this play, is apparently Portugal's most prolific living playwright. He may be quick, but on the evidence of this effort, he is also very bad. But somehow, again, we we survived it, didn't and we? And you gave me you gave me a Swedish massage, one of your Swedish massages there for the first time, when you were working in masseuse as a masseuse or a masseur or whichever it was, <laughs> and very 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 deeply felt that was. I gave I I am in in fact a trained uh, masseur. Yes, uh, I know you don't know everything about me, but that is a fact. <laughs> I gave the whole cast massages um, just before the show started because, in all honesty, we were all so stressed. Mm. Everybody needed massages. And then we moved on, didn't we, from that highlight to another highlight at the Union Theatre, where I played your lover. Well, I've got... And we had many rehearsals in your basement in Keystone Crescent while you were mounting me and trying to remember the words do you remember well um there we are now i'm sorry <laughs> i'm sorry you brought that up uh, <laughs> okay it's a play called sugar snap it was, oh, sugar it was snap. done at the union theater it wasn't our finest hour by any means but yes um we had a a, a sex scene in this play and so we decided to work it out ourselves <laughs> on, on my couch <laughs> I'll never forget it, darling. You know, I, I have I have flashbacks to those moments several times in the middle of the night, as the in the words of Betty Grable, I wake up screaming. <laughs> it, that, that, in, in pleasure or pain, I really don't know which. <laughs> it's too long ago to remember, but I have a feeling that those those rehearsals were good fun. You know, because everything oh. was timed. So I said, I'll pull your shirt off on this line. <laughs> Oh, the fun, the fun we had. Anyway, yes, um, that was Sugar Snap. Let's hope it wasn't recorded. But going back now to 2005, uh, Tony and I uh, did a film in, in Morocco uh, called In the Place of the Dead. And it's on this DVD and it's called Worst Fears and it's still on Amazon. And uh, look, that is Tony Wise. Oh, my God. Yes, yes. I do have that DVD, yes, I've never noticed that, yes. Great, I mean, fantastic films, they really were. And I'm very, very, very proud of that movie and the experience going to Morocco, it was just incredible. Hopefully to be repeated in the not too distant future. <laughs> beyond the realms of possibility, yes. We, we did that film in, in Morocco and we did have a great time. And the film, yeah. I have to say, did uh, win an award somewhere. I can't remember where now. But that was uh, yeah, shot, shot in a week in Marrakesh. And uh, I thought, oh, I'd like to come back here to make a film. Now, there is a chance I'm going back to make a, a feature film called The Wrong People. But we'll be dealing with that. Uh, in another episode of the series. And if I do do it, then uh, there's every chance that uh, Tony Wise will be playing a disgusting pervert. Okay? I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that with you. Um, so uh, what's uh, going to happen now is that uh, any moment uh, we're going any moment now we're going to hear from our uh, delightful friends uh, Peccadillo, who uh, host this series. We like to know what they're up to, and uh, they respond by uh, playing one of their trailers. So um, uh, have a look at this uh, right now, but then join us again in another couple of minutes for more revelations with this week's special guest, 
Tony Wise. Det träffades ni förresten. Det tror jag aldrig jag har hört. Vi hade chattat ett tag. Då hade han iväg på något fotojobb till LA. Men då kunde han inte vänta. Så efter tre veckor så knackade jag på dörren till mitt hotellrum. <laughs> ja, men det verkar ju funka. För när vi kom hem sen så flyttade vi ihop nästan direkt. Så du kan inte ens säga det längre. Jag är ledsen. Jag vet inte vad jag ska säga. Jag tänkte du med som att du bara hade, hade en dipp eller något. Jag är inte intresserad av att träffa någon ny. Ja, du behöver inte träffa någon ny för att hitta en ny pojk. Men ja, det ska vara lite kul. Jag har träffat någon. En ny kille. Jag vill tillbaka till min säng. Du och jag får prata om någon annan då. Vi måste faktiskt sova här nu. Vår säng! Se om det fanns något kvar. Nu kommer se att allt är borta. Jag är inte blind. Jag fattar. Jag älskar dig, Hans. Jag kommer alltid göra det. Wow, vilken cool story. Det låter som bästa rum kommer nu. Yes, Are We Lost Forever? Can't wait uh, to see that. Um, I'm David McGillivray. I'm here with my guest this week, Anthony Tony, to me, because we're so close, Tony Wise. And here's an interesting thing, uh, Tony. Uh, every week, um, Peccadillo try to match the trailer to whoever my guest is. So I thought, oh, I wonder why they're uh, choosing are we lost forever? So I went uh, to look the film up on IMDb, and this is a, an extract from um, the synopsis. Each scene exudes sorrow, desperation, and unrequited love. So there you go. That's what Peccadillo thinks of when they think about Tony Wise. Make a what, what you will. What 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 is this? What was it called again? Yes, we've got to watch that film now. It's called "Are We Lost Forever," and it's from oh, Sweden. Right. Okay. And it looked it looks rather enticing, I must say. Now, Tony, uh, I mentioned earlier that you're probably um, Victoria Wood's greatest fan. Now, what astounds me <laughs> in rehearsals it, is that you're able to recite her sketches word for word is that correct practically yeah one or one or two you know i i put a couple on youtube but i don't know how to get you know make it make it public on youtube and it's just sitting there with no viewers and i i, I i'm hopeless at all that sort of thing so but but i did two of her kelly marie tunstall uh um one of my sort of uh, and i inverted it to to being a a, a a man doing it, being chatted up by a, by a woman, you know, uh, and it seemed to work okay, didn't it? You know, it, it does indeed. I'm I'm one of the few people who's seen it, but that's because I can reveal there are so many people with Tony Wise channels on YouTube. I mean, you scroll down them, there's literally dozens and dozens, possibly hundreds. So I said to Tony, you've got to call yourself Tony, get in the back of the van, Wise. Oh, right, okay. And then I think you go right to the top of the list. Anyone, mm -hmm. anyone looking for that then gets to see uh, Tony's delightful rendition of these uh, Victoria Wood sketches. Tell me, Tony, what is it? What was it about Victoria? Her wit, her, her poetry in the rhythm of her writing, her ear, just, I mean, and of course I'm Northern, although I'm from to the side at Pennines, I'm a Yorkshire boy, but, you know, even though she's Lancashire, you know, I mean, she just listens and just hears and remembers things and writes, and, and it's, she has this incredible rhythm and, and music. I mean, she's a poet as well as a wonderful comedian and a very, very good actress as well, you know. I'm so I, I'm still in mourning for her, really. My greatest my greatest thrill was when I was in um, in State Fair at the Trafalgar Studios, 
and she was in the audience. I've performed for Victoria Wood. My my career is uh, 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 that couldn't get higher. Couldn't get higher. Did, <laughs> did you speak to her afterwards? No, she was with her manager, and they, she they, they, she was whisked whisked away. You know, yeah. I don't think she. I think she's quite shy. I don't think she sort of did much of that. You know. Oh, but, I'm, but she was there, and I, you know, as as one does in the Trafalgar Studios, you know, I, I'm totally focused as a stage actor. I was cruising around the. Oh, there she is up there. <laughs> I must remember. <laughs> Did you, did you suddenly spot her in the audience, or had you been warned that she was in the house? Yeah, we 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 knew we knew she was coming. There were two seats reserved for her, and she was just a tiny little bit late as well. So she was sort of you know coming in. You know, actually, no, she wasn't late. Her manager was late, but she she wouldn't come in without her manager there, sort of, or her, her you know a confidant, whoever it was. I don't know. I bet she enjoyed it. I mean, Tony Wise in State Fair. Who wouldn't? <laughs> now, we also talked about um, your career in, in opera, opera, which is ah. extraordinary. Um, mm. You've been in um, several versions of Carmen. You've been yeah. in a TV version. And I have to say the biggest thrill um, for me and our mutual friend Celia was going to see you in Carmen at Glindbourne. Do you remember that? That was in 2015, five years ago. Yes, yeah. Well, I I, 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 I first played Lilas Pastia, who is the French speaking role in Carmen, uh, which there are few and far between, unfortunately, in 1997 for the WNO. And I went on several tours with them, and uh, that was uh, Moshe Liza and Patrice Courier production. And then I I did the two, uh, 2002 version at Glyndebourne with David McVicker directing. Now that was that's an experience to be directed by David Blessin. I mean, <laughs> he's a whirlwind. He really is. We, we, want, course, we want to know more about it, Tony, but of course we have to establish right now absolutely. you're not you're not singing arias in in Carmen. You have one of the speaking roles. Uh, yes, you're, indeed. You're the, indeed, tavern, indeed. You're the tavern. And two or three years ago, I did the household meister in um, Ariadne of Naxos, which is a wonderfully funny part, uh, speaking part. At the beginning, is very haughty, snobby. Metro D, sort of, you know, just it's a great part, and I got to play that at the Longborough Festival in the Cotswolds two years ago. But tell us, uh, come on, what's it like then being directed by David McVicker at this this glorious opera house, Glindbourne? We had a great time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's he 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 was a firebrand in those days. He was really like, you know, he 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 he. You know, he 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 was he was a, a firebrand. I, I can only say that. I mean, I I went up to him in the first coffee coffee break. I remember I said, "Oh, hello," because no introductions, nothing. Like straight into the reading. Let's come, let's go on with. No, you didn't have any who else was in the room. There's about sixty people all in the room. You know, with the singers and the uh, the covers and the the stage management crew, the lighting. Everybody was there for the first reading, and I went up to the. I went up in the and said, oh, hello, David, you know, um, do, do you remember me? I, I'm Anthony, I'm, you know, it's a cotta. I can remember you, buddy cast you, didn't I? You know, that was, that was my first words with David. But he got to quite like me, I think, I hope. Because, you know, I he, that production was revived umpteen times and he always came in with different directors, but he always came in to check that it was his production at the end. Oh, it's wonderful working with opera singers. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Being on stage with a singer in full flow, it really makes the, the hairs on your neck stand up. I just, God, I have so much admiration for opera singers. I really do. So you, in, in effect, you've got a, a front row seat for a production of Carmen every night. So mm. you're, you're very lucky, uh, to, as you say, to be in such close proximity to this these magnificent performers. Mm. That's great, yeah. And the chorus, the chorus is always good fun as well. You know, they're, they're right laugh. You know, they're, they're sort of, you know, it's it's mayhem basically, but it's ordered mayhem. But it's great, absolutely fantastic. 
you you've also been in uh, several productions uh, staged by uh, an outfit called the new factory of the eccentric actor and um, they're worth bringing into the conversation now because they do very large scale productions as well um, you know sometimes with a, a cast of over a hundred and they they perform everywhere you know in in factories in, in this year in fact in a in a in a square in in London these are remarkable productions aren't they aren't they tony and oh absolutely why i i came late to it because um i i i've known penny for years who, who's the main lady behind it and and gary the director i mean they you know they say oh can you do it yeah okay well what what days can you rehearse monday wednesday okay all right don't worry but anyway just turn up on the night and go for it and that's it you have the clue sometimes you perform never having rehearsed with the person you're doing the scene with but somehow it always works extraordinary experience it really is they are an inspiration though penny and, and gary they really are and they bring extraordinary people together. It's true, and I'm I'm going to make sure that they 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 watch this show on on YouTube, uh, Tony. Oh uh, right, okay. <laughs> I, I get offered a part in the next one. It's all about the Russian Russian Revolution and that that type of era. They're very committed. Well, dare one say, you know, radical sort of you know revolutionary type sort of theatre. Yeah. It, it's it's the equivalent of uh, what we used to call uh, agit prop. Remember that yeah, phrase. Yeah. Gosh, yeah. Time time now, uh, Tony, uh, to m mention one of your most important roles. Now this was in uh, Justice League, not oh. not that long ago. I know there's a, a long story behind this uh, production because. Well, first of all, you were telling us all, I'm in this film. I can't tell you anything about it. It was top secrecy. You'd signed bits of paper. I want to know all about that. You had two directors. The shoot went on. It seemed like for years you were working on this film. What was going on when you were working on Justice League? Yes, yes, yes. It was it was extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. I mean, the, the, the filming went on for at least for six months in 2016 and then the edit was 2017 for release in London to November 2017 and I was there for about four weeks for about three scenes you know it was absolutely extraordinary it was a lovely little role the 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 the, the, uh, the caretaker in the star star factory and had a lovely scene with um um, cyborg's father and uh, i met 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 a couple of the other guys as well two, two of the superheroes i actually had one scene where i sat below um what's the name's legs you know wonder woman's legs and i could you know <laughs> her legs were right there just for the take because the standing did most of it you know but anyway it was extraordinary uh, but then halfway through it um um zach snyder's daughter sadly died and there were problems as well i think the film was practically totally reshot in 2017 by joss whedon um, from buffy uh, renown and then it the theater release was panned and just it, it, they, they squashed it into two hours six superheroes or seven super <clears throat> you know zack snyder wanted to make a massive epic and he's going to do it because next year um, the Zack Snyder, the director's cut of Justice League is coming out on HBO in four hour long episodes. There's not many actors I know who've been in productions costing $300 million. And that was just my get out of bed fee. <laughs> That's just Tony's fee. Um, um, and also, I love this because you had a, a stunt man, didn't you, doing some of your performance? He, absolutely. This this lookalike they found from from Leeds, a stunt man. They found, you know, it was uncanny because he when when I'm thrown against the wall, that's not me. That's the stunt man, of course. And then there was a scene which was cut, obviously, when Cyborg lifts me up and throws me over his shoulder. And Zack Snyder said, oh, we can't do that because he's got to run out with you. We can't afford the insurance if he if he breaks his, you no, know, if he hurts himself, because I'm not light. Uh, I'm not fat. 
But uh, but the next day there was this dummy made up an absolute lookalike. That was what happened in the props. Immediately I think, and this lifelike dummy, I wish I could have taken it away. It was uncanny. It was just me as a this stuffed dummy. <laughs> That's not, not a reflection of my performance, I hasten to add. <laughs> anyway, it was extraordinary performance. You know, me and Ben Affleck were like that. You know, we're just like that, you know. <laughs> He walked right past me. I didn't know who the heck he was. Somebody said that was Ben Affleck. I don't know who was it. I don't know. He, he, he talks about you to me constantly, <laughs> Tony. Now, uh, uh, let's uh, move on to the appalling subject of, of COVID-19. We have to because you are one of three people I've known who's had it. I want to know how it came about and what is it like? We live with this every day, but not all of us know exactly what it's like to experience it. Well, I, I, I think there are various levels of it, as we keep hearing, like young people don't know they've got it and things like that. But I, um, I went to two events in the week before March the 12th and March the 14th. I know it absolutely to this day. I, I played bridge with people and one the guy I was playing bridge with got it, but I don't think from me and he sadly passed away. Hey, Jeremy, my dear friend, Jeremy, 85, eight days on a, on, a, on a machine in Chelsea and Westminster. And then I went to a 60th birthday party in Amersham on the 14th and 10 of us got COVID the next week. My my first thing you notice your pelvis aching. You can't move in bed, and then it takes you. I had it really badly, apart from my lungs, mercifully. But I just thought I might die here, and I I, I live alone. I'm rather sad like that. I'm afraid. <laughs> I love it actually. But uh, you know, when you're lying awake, you know, uh, with a dismal headache and reposes to boot by anxiety, all that. Um, um, it's very, very frightening, very frightening because, I mean, I, I couldn't eat anything. The only thing you ate was oranges and Marmite and Lucasade, um, you know, three childish things that you don't think you'll ever eat again. Um, and water and maybe a cup of tea. But I, a headache, you know, throat, night sweats. I was changing my sheets two or three times a night, uh, going to, not only getting out of bed for, for about three, three, three hours a day. Awful, awful. How long did this go on for, Tony? 13 days, from March the 19th to April the 2nd. And how were you getting fed? Were, were friends leaving food at, on your doorstep? People were leaving you paracetamol, because uh, you couldn't get paracetamol for love nor money, and just leaving me oranges and, and food and books at my door, you know. And the phone was ringing. People were texting, "Go, I go away. I don't. Yeah, lovely. Thank you, but no, I'm still ill. I still feel like uh, I had it really quite badly. I think actually, I felt absolutely terrible. And you didn't know when it was going to end. There was nobody to ring. You couldn't go to the doctor. Anything. But then, then gradually you got better did you know you were getting better or did you think oh i'm just going through another well, phase. this is going to go on and on no where well, people kept saying oh you'll be all right it, it'll be two weeks you know you know 10 12 13 14 days and sure enough but i was still very very weak for a, a week afterwards you know i really i felt okay but i had no energy and I remember, and I was still getting the first time I went to the shops uh, with this mask business. And I, I'd sort of like I'd been somewhere else, and going outside again was like really weird. And I was very unconfident and very, very nervous going outside. It really, it really knocks you back, and and you you feel strange. And then, but for a week I didn't do anything. So it was about Easter time before I started sort of going out again. So it was three weeks, really. Well, there's a, there's a happy ending uh, to this story. I mean, obviously, you're still with us, thank goodness. But you're one of the few actors who's actually managed to make another film while we're in lockdown. Now, how did this come about? And what is the situation like on a film set now during the pandemic? Well, um, I was offered the job in the February 
to shoot on April the 14th, just after Easter. Of course, that was a no-no, and I was ill anyway, you know, you know and nothing happened. And then again, they, they put it forward to do July, and that was cancelled as well. And I just thought, oh, they're just going to abandon it. But no, 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 it's a, it's a massive, massive production called Glow and Darkness about the life of Francis of Assisi. It's going to be on Netflix or Apple or one, one of the channels. I don't, I'm never quite sure which. Huge production. I mean, they filmed a lot in Morocco earlier with Barbarossa uh, up in the mountains above Marrakesh. You know, there's apparently there's a whole film set there practically. They use it a lot. And, and no, 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 they, uh, and no expense was spared. And I went over for the first time in August, but they, the shooting dates were all muddled up because they were obviously actors flying in and out, you know, because of COVID and this and that, and you had to have a COVID test on arrival. And then we waited in this sort of Madrid equivalent of Croydon sort of hotel sort of for about three days. What about social distancing on the set? Are you, are you allowed to come anywhere near your fellow actors? Um, yes, once you've had the thing, uh, you, you obviously wear a mask um, until you actually do the take and all that. But then for the take, I mean, I didn't have to actually, although actually one of the actors did come like this close to me, but no, they, no, it was just shock. The director, <laughs> I better be careful what I say. One of those people who, who thinks COVID's a great sort of mega plan to sort of ruin the world, you know. Uh, he, 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 I mean, he, he's, he's a good director and my God, it's going to be epic if it comes out. Uh, but there you go. No, it, it was difficult filming, but I went to three beautiful Spanish towns to film that you'd never go to anyway, beautiful. I had a fantastic time, despite the difficulties. Tell us again, um, uh, Tony, who, who are you playing? What's the title? We want to watch out for it. it. It's called, at the moment, it's called Glow Under Darkness, and it's about the life of Francis of Assisi. And I play Pope Alexander III. <laughs> From my days of nudity in the King's Road. <laughs> if only the Catholic Church knew about it and many other things as well. I'd be excommunicated. But I played Pope Alexander, Barbarossa's uh, mortal enemy, who tried to dethrone him several times. And it was uh, the, really the historic, I think it'll be in episode one that I'm in, because alas, my Pope is dead now, so I can't go back and film anymore. Oh, we can't wait. Uh, Tony, we've all most been beaten by the clock as well but i just want to mention you you've you you've got another short film out at the moment and it is available on amazon prime um can you just say one sentence about something called morbid curiosity oh is that the one being interviewed by you nothing nothing to do with me uh, tony i just found it on your cv do you remember it morbid curiosity you may have done it a while back, but anyway, it's out now, and what, it. What, 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 what am I doing in it? I, I, I uh... don't ask me. <laughs> I haven't got a clue. I, I did one called um, um, Personality, uh, which was rather good. I was playing a lunatic uh, doctor, lunatic psychiatrist. Um, Maybe the title's changed, but whatever it is, it's now called uh, Morbid Curiosity. I'm sure it's only going to cost you about 23p to watch. We'll, we'll leave it there, Tony. All what right. fun we've had. Thank you so well, much. I mean, it's been a delight. I was nervous. I was really nervous. But, uh, uh, you know, it's flowed all right, hasn't it? You know. I have to say, I've, I've had such fun. It's been uh, an absolute delight. I'm so glad you did it rather than saying, oh, no, I'm too nervous. I won't bother. <laughs> Tony, this is it for now for us. I'm going to wave you goodbye. Don't go anywhere just yet, though, uh, because we're going to do... Um... Find nude photographs of me are available uh, via my agent. <laughs> and, we, and we might dole some out on 
Patreon because uh, although we're winding up here on YouTube, of course, Patreon subscribers get 15 bonus minutes. You can go over to the Patreon site right now. There's the link. But from Tony Wise and myself, David McGillivray, it's bye bye for now. I'll be back same time next week with another delightful guest. Please join me then. But for now. From Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye-bye.